lights off. Okay, well, let us know via the chat if there are some other audio or visual difficulties. But anyway, I'm Joe Medeiros. I taught here for uh, 18 years full time, 16 years before that at Modesto Junior College. And then I continued on to work with the Sierra College Press. So uh, I am uh, 35 full time years teaching biology, botany, ecology, tree hugging, dirt worshiping, and things of that, of that nature. I'm glad there's an ad class here today because that's where I think it, it should all start, especially the soils uh, class, I, I hear. So um, I enjoy <clears throat> the I enjoy a lot of things about Sierra College, um, and we're here with uh, an ECOS group, and that's the the group that uh, sponsored me here today. I appreciate the large check that's available. Oh, you didn't hear about that? Oh, okay. Well, uh, I'm very glad that uh, that when I came here in 1990. Uh, we had just organized ECOS, so that was called the Environmentally Concerned Organization of Students, and some of you might remember Josh Beers, no, yeah, Josh Beers, uh, who was, uh, you know, the beginner of that, that program as well. So ECOS has been around for a long time. My mission here today is to kind of share with you something that I've been sharing um, in lectures and in uh, yeah. Anyone, I know you that will that will listen to me. We're getting feedback here. If if uh, some of you have your mics on, you might uh, silence them. Anyway, I'm going to continue on here. So this is a bristle cone pine. We'll talk about it just uh, a little bit in the future. But I want to dedicate this. Uh, presentation as I do all of my pre uh, presentations, um, if it will advance, but it's not advanced. I'll do it for you. Um, oh, what's going on? <laughs> technicalities. <laughs> when it rains, it pours, Joe. Your computer's frozen. Oh, okay, I'm going to do it from here. We got it. Okay, I want to dedicate this to my grandkids. Uh, we have three grandchildren. And it's their future that is uh, so important to us and the futures of their grandkids um, as well. And so <clears throat> thanks to this inspiration of them and wanting to continue sharing what I know about uh, nature and ecology and so on, we, uh, we continue to dedicate uh, education really to seven generations and, and beyond in the, in the future. This is proof that uh, I am uh, one of many tree huggers. There's, uh, I think, Shauna Martinez is, is right there. There's, how about that band? Does that have to show up on the top? We're not getting the full uh, view here. But <clears throat> so many of us uh, have enjoyed uh, tree hugging. This is up in the Sierra Nevada at Olmstead Point. You've probably been very close to this uh, tree um, in, in the high Sierra. These, Trees that are thousands of years old. So lots of tree huggers out there, and it's always nice to be among tree huggers as as well. I also want to dedicate this presentation to those people, and mostly women, that are doing the work to dig deeply back into Native American contributions to botany, Native American contributions to uh, plant sciences. Uh, ecological management of, of food crops, uh, of, of forest ecosystems, and so on. And here are three outstanding presentations of uh, books uh, by Kat Anderson, Tending the Wild Up on the Left, who focuses mostly on Western and California, especially in plants in the Sierra Nevada. Uh, in the middle, Nancy Turner, who focuses her work up in the Pacific Northwest, reuniting the wisdom and the knowledge of Native peoples with, uh, Native, with uh, the utilization and management uh, of, of Native plants and Native ecosystems for food and for fiber, for, for drink, for spirituality, etc. Then finally, I'll talk more about braiding sweetgrass and one of my favorite uh, authors, uh, Robin Wall Kimmerer, who's 
in at the uh, uh, State University of New York in, in Syracuse in the uh, environmental sciences and forestry uh, program there in upstate New York. Once again, we're not advancing. Yeah, and hold on, Joe, because the slides are not showing up for the folks in Zoom land because okay. I don't know how to get out of here. We're going to do this differently. For those of you that are still in Zoom land, just give me your name and I'll come out and I'll give you my presentation one on one. Uh, all you okay. want. We're going to do it this way, which is at least now they can see which slide we're on. So, real quick, it's got to show the grandkids and okay. the Shauna's. And others, the students us, so. and the books you just talked about. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Great. So I'm going to be your advancer and I'll go, oh, for, right. go fast. So uh, Robin Wall Kimmer begins her book with a story of two, two women, two, uh, two origins stories, uh, one from the past, uh, both, both uh, women's stories, but the sky woman falling from the sky and beginning Earth, you know, with with a new story of how Earth was was formed and all the organisms that, that helped her along the all, along the way. And of course our modern story to the right of Adam and Eve, where instead of being uh, instead of forming and participating in and nourishing uh, the Eden that you were provided, they're driven out of, uh, of Eden and then have to take from it. There's an adversarial type of uh, situation in instead um, of a participatory uh, situation. Um, how do you do this? Uh, just go ahead. So, so we uh, then are faced with uh, this long, long understanding of many, many, many years uh, ago of peoples for thousands of years, understanding species, uh, first off as animists, where species, rocks, rivers, creeks, cloud formations, uh, nature or whatever, were all speaking to individuals and their relationships uh, to, the, to themselves. Um, as has been animus. And then not, not long after that, we see the rise of, of polytheists, where there are numerous gods that are all responsible for different things and so on. And then we land on this interesting thing called monotheists, where there must, of course, be but one god. <clears throat> um, yeah. And so we're going to look at a, at a picture here that we've seen so many times before, a, uh, a story that goes back then to uh, Noah and the, and the flood. And I'd like you to look at this picture and tell me what's, what's missing from this story? What's missing from this artwork? The, well, humans, yes, there's many humans in there too, but there are no plants. So is this a bad move? If you want to take every species that's out there and, and reestablish them someplace and not take the plants, this tells us immediately how we feel about plants. That all of these animals are the most important things on earth, but that plants are insignificant. They are a few little plants in the corners here and so on, but of course there are no plants being loaded on to the to the ark. Next. <clears throat> So we can go into all of these different philosophers and so on, where they establish the hierarchy of plants. And each one was, it was different, of course, but they all, each and every one of these uh, uh, so-called great philosophers and, and scholars placed plants way down close to the bottom. Next slide. And as you can see, uh, there were things that just barely exist. Rocks and minerals were inexistent, but pivot or life then exists just a step up the pyramid here where plants and other organisms that were uh, present, but they did not move. They were just barely given a place above, uh, above being ex existent at all. And then, of course, as you go up the ladder, uh, scent 
refers to sentience and the ability to sense things and to interpret and all of that. Animals, of course, get that category to them. And then intelligence, humans at the very top. And this is not the pyramid that we all kind of grew up with, right? That there were all of these things, but the species that was the most important were the plural species that were most important were animals, and then of course primates and uh, humans at the at the very top. Oh, we're moving. It's good. Okay. So for those of you that are biologists or anybody that's had any biology class, you're a biologist or not, you're going to hear about. Uh, Carolus Linnaeus or Carl von Linné, who established a nomenclature system by which you could actually name different species from animals, plants, and fungi, and so on, given the scientific name that was based in uh, the Latin. Sorry, Joe. <laughs> We're trying to get you on the right camera again, but it's all right. You don't need to, to see me. You just, uh, all right. um, just imagine me. Maybe we'll just keep that picture up. That looks like you. And there we go. Um, but uh, so so uh, so with Car uh, Carol Linnaeus and the scientific naming of all of these different species and so on, we're still even Carol. I want to call him Carl von Linné, which was his real name. And Carol Linnaeus said that hmm, interesting. These plants seem to be thoughtful. They seem to be responsive to touch. And things of that nature, but we're still going to keep them down here um, at the very bottom. And uh, because they have sex, I can't really talk about it. Yet his whole his entire nomenclatural system was established on the sexuality of plants, animals, and so on, how they in fact uh, reproduce. Next. Then, of course, comes uh, uh, Charles Darwin, um, whose famous voyage of, of the Beagle brought to us phenomenal change in the view of life and that it might be uh, mutable, that life might change, that species uh, might in fact change over time. And thanks to his observations of fossils and so on, they could see that life had in fact changed over time, not having, of course, all of the information that we have today about, about dating and so on. It, it, it hampered his ability to really interpret it, but he also <clears throat> was saying that many, many times he would say the plants are extremely interesting and they're, they may even be thoughtful. And as a matter of fact, sometimes it, it appears that they might even think. Well, it was he and his son. I mean, Darwin was more of a botanist than he was a geologist or a geography or whatever. He wrote uh, 60 different presentations, uh, you know, on plants alone. Next. But his, it was his work that stimulated the interest in, of his son, Francis, to continue on in the research and do more research about plants and how they were, in fact, uh, quite sentient. They could sense things. And he even equated uh, root tips to brains and that, that plants could communicate with each other. He was almost thrown out of academies, but yet he continued on. And he may be you know, our plant uh, physiologist next. So just to uh, quickly go uh, back over time, this this is just, you know, I wish Dick Hilton was here so I could uh, harangue on him and his, his, we used to go around all the time about geology. Uh, what do we, as we look at uh, the, the alter, alteration or changes of species over time, what do we look at mostly? We look at, where species change in the uh, long history of life on Earth, especially in the fossil record. But which fossils showed up the best were, of course, uh, animal fossils. So the, the geologists and the paleontologists established this elaborate system by which we separate uh, the Precambrian from the three major divisions of paleozoic, Mesozoic, and so on. But if you remember, way up here, humans at the very top of our of our clock show up at the very last, basically the last second in time. So are we the most advanced or are we the last ones uh, to arrive? And if you look at where plants show up, they're way down here um, at two o'clock. I, I know that some of you on 
<clears throat> on the line can see where my pointer is, but about two o'clock in the diagram, yeah, thanks. You'll see where plants uh, show up hundreds of thousands of years ago, and certainly a long time before uh, animals ever show up. And in the great spiral of this same uh, paleontology, though, we see that, that uh, plants are way earlier than this thing way earlier in their evolution on Earth, and they've had a great deal uh, of, of amount of time to evolve since then. So I love these, uh, these two guys. One is Kurt Johnson, who's the curator of the paleontological department um, at the Smithsonian, and the artist is Ray Troll, and if you've ever seen any of his uh, work, they're really, really funny. He does art he does a lot of evolution stuff, a lot of stuff about fish. Maybe you've got a t-shirt that says, you know, spawn till you die or something of this nature. One of his pieces, pieces of work. But he's a real evolution uh, evolutionist. <clears throat> and uh, I think there's one. Uh, oh, yeah. So, uh, but the point that I, I wanted to make here is as we look at this geologic time scale, what are we using to represent those species? that have changed over time. We see that in the Paleozoic, we've got lots of heart fossil animals. We see in the Mesozoic, dinosaur days, and that, you know, more and more dinosaurs and so on. And then in the Cenozoic, the age of mammals and so on. We are focusing entirely, once again, in our uh, obsession with animals. And these two guys do the very same thing. The next slide, I just love his, his cartoons. Um, his, his, his name is Ray Troll, and if you go to Ray Troll Art, you can pick up his t-shirts, and he does stuff on evolution of especially fish, but also of the dinosaurs and animals as well. But when you look at the other artwork that he's done, done like this one of California and Nevada, you know, what's in there, again, the artwork is always, you know, focus on the fossil animals that existed before. There's one leaf. But oh, there's, there's a leaf. leaf and there's another. And as a matter of fact, out in Nevada, there were giant sequoias that were growing in the Mesozoic at the very same time. This I'm just trying to demonstrate here as we, as we go on, um, that we focus on animals and their fossils and so on. We still don't focus on the plant themselves. And Rachel did this magnificent cartoon of uh, life over time. But once again, on the left, you'll see animals, 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 and these great extinction events. But I took issue with this next slide, and I decided that I put plants in there and do the same thing with my cartoon. So you'll see that we started way, way back. We, I, I'm a plant myself, <laughs> and been trying to, to evolve chlorophyll for the longest time. But um, as plants start with uh, blue green algae, the stomatolites, and, and so on. But the first land plants start showing up way, way back in the Paleozoic, hundreds of thousands of years ago. The Mesozoic is the age of, of conifers and gymnosperms, and of course, the Cenozoic is the age of flowering plants that just uh, radiate. So all of these other species show up at the same time. Then you have, in fact, fossils that represent these two. And as a matter of fact, this museum just outside these doors are a spectacular array of both plants and animals uh, with, with a tremendous fossil uh, record. So let's go to what these, you know, who are these plants uh, anyway? They're green, they're chlorophyllous, they're, they're, they're not, uh, they're colonies of cells. We'll get back to that in a minute. Some of them are fleshy or herbaceous, some are woody. Some are annuals that live in a short period of time. Some are biennial and grow every, every few years before they flower. And others are perennial that will grow year after year after year. They're sessile, right? They don't move. This is why all the early uh, philosophers and so on wanted to put them in the same category as you would put rocks and fungi and things like that because they don't uh, run around. However, they move, but albeit uh, very slowly. They're all photosynthetic, or are they? Most are autotrophs. They can feed themselves, but some are parasites. Some are uh, commensals, where one benefits in their partnership and the other 
is uh, unaffected. And then others are uh, symbionts that work together. Importantly, plants have been around for 800 million years, and they have 800,000 years, and they have uh, had opportunities then to uh, develop relationships, very, very close interrelationships with lots of other species. Importantly, plants are a lot harder to kill than animals. You wanna wipe out an animal? Get them in the head, right? Even just drill a parasite through the into their brain, and you can goof them up for the rest of their lives or whatever. But if you've ever tried to get rid of Bermuda grass or some perennial uh, oleander or something like that, you know how hard they are to kill. They also defend themselves uh, exceptionally well. We don't need to talk about endosymbiosis necessarily, but human biology we learned you know quite a bit about this. But they started having relationships with other species long, long, long ago when uh, eukaryotic cells started, uh, <clears throat> when ancestral prokaryotes started developing then uh, interrelationships with, with the bacteria and photosynthetic bacteria. Uh, they uh, they then developed all of these relationships with some of which are symbiotic. They I mean, they're all symbiotic relationships. Some are endosymbiotic, like we learned with, um, with, with the um, endosymbiosis theory. Others are things like epiphytes that live upon other plants. There are, there are to the right, you'll see uh, parasitic plants, I mean, to the middle, parasitic plants, carnivorous plants. And then down on the lower left, I'd like to pose this as a problem to you or a question to you. You know, we keep calling these things uh, mistletoes that are, we keep calling them uh, parasites that are on upon other trees. But notice that all of the leaves are off of this tree in the dead of winter. The green uh, uh, mistletoe is still photos photosynthesizing very well. We now have information demonstrating that there's food actually going from the mistletoe to the tree during the winter time as well. So should you cut them all out? Well, you know, you might want to do it for Christmas for, for a kissing under the tree or something, but um, it might not necessarily be so uh, necessary. Now, to be fair, the mistletoe, they can, they can get so aggressive, they can occlude the vascular system of a branch and so on. So, But they're not going to destroy the, the whole tree. So partnerships that exist with bacteria, vascular plants like legumes, uh, working in partnership with bacteria for nitrogen fixation. And then especially where we want to focus this up in, in plants is with mycorrhizae. And to the right, you'll see a vascular plant which has fungal associations all around its, its roots. And so at first, when we ripped out plants from the ground and wondered what was going on and see all these fungi on there. Immediately, we thought that these must be parasites. This damn fungus is coming in to destroy this, this plant, but the plant is doing okay. Hmm, what's going on here? There are, in fact, numerous fungal parasites on plants and so on. But why is this tree doing uh, relatively well with a with it literally a mantle of fungi wrapped around its root system. Uh, we'll go into some other next. We'll, we'll see some uh, other relationships that plants have had. They have relationships with insects, with birds, cooperative pollination strategies, and so on. So this phenomenal mutualistic symbiosis that exists between plants, um, especially for the, uh, the, the process of pollination and then see dispersal later on next. Um, or do some plants by their design and evolution then enslave vascular plants like these unicorn plants. They, they also call them devil's claw on the left. This plant has evolved this strategy to be carried away by some animal to disperse its seed. Same way with cocklebur uh, down in the right hand corner there. Uh, with this interesting relationship, which um, is clearly an enslaving relationship to get their seeds uh, uh, distributed elsewhere next. Importantly, 
we seem to ignore all these plants. And I have to tell this story. Every time I try to talk to young kids about plants and everything, even if just a, a, a spider falls by or a butterfly flies by, their attention is lost immediately. So you wonder, what is it about us when 99% of our ecosystem out there is dominated by plants? Are we so distracted by animals? Given birds are fabulous, insects are incredible, all these wonderful things, but we can't forget the plants. They make up nearly all of our biomass on Earth. And I just want to go to Madagascar so badly. We definitely need an eco field trip to Madagascar uh, to, to see these phenomenal, phenomenal trees. I'll be the faculty sponsor. Yeah, <laughs> of course. Next. Those are baobab trees, by the way. And this is in Mexico. This is a little bit easier to get to, but it's just Arbol del Tule, uh, this phenomenal Montezuma cypress that exists down in, uh, in uh, Oaxaca. But these grandiose, magnificent, and in many cases, ancient trees that exist all around the world. Next. But how about their lifespan? You know, plants can exist for so much longer period of time than animals, horses, 60 years. Humans, I don't know, know who came up. This was Shauna's slide where she, she thinks that uh, humans can last for 120 years. There was years. one. One yeah, person there, lasted yeah. to 122. It's not a bell shaped curve. They don't really do that. Should I fix the slide well. right now? Yeah, right. But all of these marvelous animals and so on live for centuries or live for portions of centuries and so on. Very, very good. Next, but our plants, however, can live for much longer because they clone, because they're capable of continuing on in a vegetative form, or even certain individuals, even when they start, they can exist for thousands of years. In this case, the quaking aspen is a clone, and what you're looking at is not really a forest of quaking aspen, but a branch, I mean, a trunk of quaking aspen laying on its side with all of these branches, lateral branches sticking up in the ground, these are all clones of each other. And this entire clone is over 100 acres in size. This is Pando in Utah. Uh, but the quaking aspen then moves around over time, absorbing nutrients from its environment. And this thing has been, who knows how old it is, but they're easily, uh, you know, uh, over 10,000 years in, in age. As your radiocarbon dating. Our old Russell Gold Pines in the Sierra Nevada, <clears throat> this has to be on your list because this is doable. You can drive there or hike there or bicycle there or whatever, but you can get to the Russell Gold Pines and be in a forest of trees that are over 5,000 years old, not as clones, but instead as individual trees that have begun as uh, seeds and seedlings. Uh, from there. There are lots of other examples of these, but I think uh, uh, taking some time, we'll go straight to the question of our plant's intelligence, right? So if we look at some questions, look, they dominate the biomass of Earth, they have a long, long history um, on Earth. So what says you're not more advanced if you're here in such a short period of time? They feed themselves in one way or another. They certainly know how to defend themselves. They breathe without lungs or energy requirements. Think of trees that take water up into the tops of the, of the tips of their trees, 400 feet above in the case of coast redwoods. You don't hear any pumps pumping. You don't see any electrical motors pushing uh, water up. You know, so they're phenomenal in their uh, mechanisms and ability to take care of themselves. Do they defend themselves? Absolutely. They breathe without lungs, without energy requirement. Do they see, do they taste, smell, all of these things? More importantly, do they solve problems, right? But we certainly know about the others. And do they remember? Do they, do they learn, right? Well, there's plenty of evidence out there to suggest that they do. First and foremost, they have a modular plan. When they started this plan, hundreds of thousands of years ago, right? <clears throat> when uh, they became uh, uh, more of a colony because like the, the internet, 
their nodes uh, are centers and their tips are researching uh, information out there everywhere. They have sentience, they can sense things, they receive that information, they can analyze it, and they can direct the actions of their roots to go in specific places. Do they have a, a memory? I will talk about that. They have emergent behavior. So collectively, working like a colony, like a flock of birds, like a school of fish, well organized and so on. What happens in one part of the plant will be directed to and information will be garnered by other parts of the plant so that the rest of the plant can take care of business depending upon the information that they have in fact uh, received. So they have a distributed uh, intelligence and this is a highly secure model, which is why you can wipe out 90% of this plant, then it will still grow. You can cut off the top of the tree, then the roots will sprout out from the bottom. You can whittle it down to practically one root. And if that root has a little bit of water and a little bit of minerals and so on, and a little bit of food storage in it somehow, it's going to make it out. And it's going to, in fact, turn green, right? I mean, this has happened so many times. Just a few days ago, you know, one of the little succulent leaves off of the plant that we had in the backyard was just laying on the ground. And I picked up this, because it was a bright color, I picked up this little succulent leaf. It fell off, you know, one of the jade plants or something. And a new little plantlet was growing right on that little plant, right? And so they are, uh, they are tenacious in their ability to reproduce. Where did they get their information? It's all about the roots. This is, goes all the way back to Darwin and Francis Darwin, his son, and so on. These roots, these roots, they're so curious. They're so information gathering. They noted that plants moved towards uh, uh, light, that their roots went to gravity, that there was motion, that there was sensing the information that was going on. And, you know, different variations of roots then. Uh, are, are seen, but it's those growing root tips that are where the information is really being uh, gathered. And each and every one of those root tips has a lot of information gathering potential. Just in one rye plant, you can have literally tens of thousands of roots, a surface area of hundreds of square meters, miles and miles and miles in length from just one plant. That's a lot of information gathering in that one system next. So do they taste? Well, these little root tips are headed out there looking for ions, cations, anions. They're looking for what they want and they're turning away from what they don't want. <clears throat> they, have, they, they are looking for water. They can move around obstacles before they get there. They don't hit it first, but they avoid it and move around it. They can measure they avoid uh, toxins, they can measure soil chemistry and humidity. They have 15 different parameters that are qualitative and quantitative. So beyond, by the way, this is way beyond what we can taste, what our ability to taste is. But they can sense something, not only its presence, if it's there or not, but also they can sense the quantity, the, the quantity of it as well. <laughs> So it's not just qual qualitative, but it's quantitative as well. And they're way beyond us in their taste capabilities. Do they store information and pass that on? Well, you know, the root can, if they get a chance to get a hold of some nitrogen or some phosphorus, they collect it all. They collect it all and bank it and save it for the future, expecting that there could be rough times ahead. So they just don't eat until they're satisfied, they eat and store and use uh, later on, developing more or less than a plant. We all know about their ability to touch, their phenomenal responses to touch, the venus flytrap tendrils, climbing up things and so on. They learn, they're trained, they, information comes back to them and they can analyze that no, this is, they can even sense and this is my own plant species. I don't want to wrap around this. I want to wrap around something different other than my own species. So they're gathering information and they're obviously their ability to move by triggering 
uh, seed and spore dispersal and so on. So the 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 touch capability of their five senses, of course, is is phenomenal. And all you need to do is look at a field of uh, sunflowers to know that they can perceive visual stimuli very well. They differentiate into different wavelengths. They're phototropic. Uh, they 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 know when and where. They're sensitive to the day and length, uh, the angle of light, and so on. And there's plenty of experiments today that show that plants uh, sleep as as well. All because, go ahead, all because we have this phenomenal uh, uh, molecule called uh, chlorophyll. <clears throat> and by the way, just recently down, uh, you can't see it very well down in the right hand corner, you see an image that was created where you could actually record not only the electromagnetic uh, ability of of, uh, of uh, chlorophyll to be sensed as a, a, a photons as, as wavelengths, but also as particles as, as well. And so they're very, very good about <clears throat> sensing the types of wavelengths that come in in their actions that occur from their neck. So do they smell or they emit all kinds of things? They sense different things, everything from smoke to different kinds of compounds. They communicate between their friends. Something is going on in this part of the plant or this part of the forest, then certain chemicals can be produced. They can waft into the uh, pores and stomata of other trees. They can communicate with each other. And responses then are generated from those, a response by making a different type of leaf, a response from making different kinds of chemicals because there's a fire nearby, because there's a predator nearby. And they respond by uh, uh, doing, you know, uh, something physical, anatomical, physiological, and so on, in response to the stimuli. I, I, down at the bottom, and this is one of my new friends at, at, at Stanford, uh, um, he's doing studies now, especially with food, and those of you that are involved in food, food economies, and so on. If you just go to Deepak Chopra's new studies in, in food and, and especially with Rajneesh, if you can write these, uh, this, this name down, the work that they're doing for food securities and dealing with uh, photosynthetic organisms and so on is absolutely phenomenal. But the work that he also does in response uh, with plant responses to different uh, uh, smells. For example, you know, they're doing work with, with uh, 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 I think uh, yeah, it's coming. ayahuasca. Uh, they're, they're they're wafting ayahuasca into the into the air and finding that plants are headed towards ayahuasca. <laughs> you know, so what's going on anyway? Uh, do they smell obvious? Do they hear? Well, there is the vector. They're in the ground. Their roots are in the ground. They're very capable of sensitive. They have mecha mechanical sensitive chambers. Whole plant ears and so on. There's agricultural phonobiology going on now in roots and in root systems. There is there's studies now that are being done that roots grow better uh, when they hear certain frequencies. Wine grapes do better if they hear not certain, you know, not uh, classical music versus hard rock or anything like that. But certain wavelengths, you can increase water uptake sugar uptake and so on by different frequencies. I know, look it up yourself, you may not have the phonotropic roots then. We know that they make noise, they click, but we don't know why roots click. It might just be because they're growing and growing snapping sounds or whatever. But nevertheless, uh, they've got all these senses, they've got five senses, they've got 15 more senses than we do next. Some of the stuff that they produce uh, secondary metabolites, alkaloids, lipids, oils, flavonoids, and so on. Holy moly, the kind of stuff that they produce for numerous reasons. One, to thwart predation. Been practicing for a whole week to say thwart and predation. That's kind of hard. But uh, they then communicate then with these different uh, chemicals to entice or to uh, avoid all these different compounds, many of which we use regularly, salicylic acid, but, you know, in aspirin and 
oral contraceptives come from diosgenin and all these different plant compounds. A really fun book to get a hold of next is this one. Uh, Wicked Plants by Amy Stewart. It is really a lot of fun. <clears throat> uh, alphabetically, here's some of the main plants, uh, plant species that are uh, covered in this book with all the different things that plants uh, can, can produce for many, many different reasons as well. But then, of course, things that we utilize and unfortunately oftentimes abuse and find that in many cases, uh, poison ourselves with uh, next. So this is one of my uh, favorite uh, plant physiologists, Stefano Mancuso is from uh, Italy. He says intelligence is the property of life from amoebas to multi-celled. Uh, the difference is quantitative, not qualitative. They all solve the very same problems that all other organisms have to do only a different speed, different rates, and so on. Next slide. I'm not going to do this to you, but I want to focus that cycle on the top. And for those of you that are biologists or any of you that have a biology class, no, the tail end over here, if you can put your cursor over there, the carbohydrates that are being produced from this magical photosynthetic reaction. If you look through what happens from that, it is the it, it produces then all of these living things, biodiversity and life, action, motion, and so on, through species diversity, and, and the reality of that simple but complex uh, equation. Next is the next few slides, and you can just move through these. This is what we get from photosynthesis. We get biological diversity. We get ecosystem diversity. <clears throat> we get all different sorts of life that are also adapting to their ability to acquire food and to metabolize food so that they can go about their business and survive in life. So it's not just producing a little bit of sugars, gotta go beyond what you learned in fourth grade, but it's producing phenomenal ecosystems around the world. And we all know that because of that, Plants provide food and fiber, shelter, energy, fuel, drink, and so on, medicines, dyes, fragrances. They are the heart and soul of learning and healing environments and beauty. You know, did we co evolve with them? Are we their servants or are we also their slaves? Some great books to, to read about that. Uh, so, next. Uh, they, you know, these are their ecological services. I guess what I'm trying to say is why aren't we praying or ad admiring or, or worshiping uh, chlorophyll every day from all of the things that we benefit from? The production of oxygen, the sequestration of carbon dioxide, flood control, watershed maintenance, climate amelioration, pollution control, it goes on and on and on. And what do we as modern humans continue to do, but we lay asphalt on top of things, we lay concrete on top of the thing. We still keep you know plants down low there, they're the lowest thing, they don't have value, right? When we do our environmental impact reports, we don't assign the dollar value of photosynthesis. So basically, it's like if, uh, without plants, it's absolutely impossible. So here's a few uh, suggestions uh, for you to carry on this, this thought and really thoroughly enjoy uh, your association, your life, your symbiosis. Pick up some books from Michael Pollan, The Omnivore's Dilemma, uh, The Desire, Botany of Desire, and so on. As you well know, he moved on into doing things like, you know, what are we doing with all of these uh, psychotropic uh, plants and things like that. So he did another uh, recent book um, it's called uh, "Help Me Out Here: uh, Changing Your Mind." Right. Um, so you know, Michael Pollan is a great guy. The next book that I would really highly recommend is by Suzanne Simard, "Finding the Mother Tree." If you liked watching Avatar, if you liked reading the book, the Overstory, uh, then you'll know this is her work. 
this is the woman who did the work to identify the ability for mycorrhizae, fungi that were associated symbiotically with plant to move carbon, to move information from one plant to another, from a mother tree to its offspring trees. From Did it recognize kin? Yes. Could it go in the other direction? If a mother needed a youngster's carbon, could it come in that direction? Yes. Could the mother, could a tree uh, identify with and associate with a tree of a different kind of the same species, a different outside of the kin? Yes. Can they identify, can they communicate with trees that are of different species? Yes, right? All through uh, mycorrhizal association. This is also a grand story about a woman in science who just had to knuckle her way up the hill uh, with you know, the, the, the typical male-dominated science uh, that, that exists even uh, yet today. But it's an absolutely marvelous piece of, of work. Next. And if you uh, <clears throat> are feeling a little fun guy lately, you really need to pick up a couple of these different books, Mycelium Honey and Entangled Life. If you don't have this much time to dive this deeply into uh, reading about mycology, go to the this movie and just rent it and uh, enjoy yourself with a big giant bowl of, of mushrooms and popcorn or whatever. No, I shouldn't even suggest that. <laughs> Not that kind of mushroom. Vegan mushrooms, of course. Uh, and, uh, and enjoy this phenomenal uh, movie called Fantastic uh, Fun Jar. It's on Netflix. It's on Netflix. Yes. Yes, I think you have to purchase it, but, but still, it's, it's worth every uh, minute of it. And it will help you understand more about plant associations uh, with, with fungi. Uh, my wife knows this. I have a bromance going with this guy. He doesn't even know I exist out there. Uh, Stefano Mancuso, he's from the University of Florence. He is a plant neurobiologist. Hear that right? You read that right? Uh, he is in the Department of Plant Neurobiology, communication within and between uh, plants. His books, besides his thousands of fabulous scientific papers, all peer reviewed and so on, uh, he writes these fabulous, easy to read books, like starting from the lower left, Brilliant Green, A Surprising History of Science. The Science of Plant Intelligence. Then I would go next to The Incredible Journey of Plants, and then Revolutionary Genius of Plants, The Nation of Plants. This guy brings you back down to a green photosynthetic plant earth and makes helps you realize how critically important plants are, how intelligent uh, they are. But his stories are marvelous. And the way he, he, he tells the stories are fabulous. Next. And then some of you may have read this before, but this is an absolute must. Just as you must go to the Bissellone Pines in the White Mountains of California someday, you must read Brady Sweetgrass by Robin Wall Kimmerer, who's a Native American, but she didn't even jump into this until she finished her PhD in plant ecology. She's with State University of New York in Syracuse. Indigenous wisdom, scientific knowledge, and the teachings of plants. This is a really a two-way street. This is trying to understand what we have missed all along, and especially how, how much what we have missed has cost us in terms of pesticides, insecticides, the, the diesel-based agricultural uh, revolution that needs to be a re-revolution uh, anymore. So this is an absolutely marvelous uh, must read, and I hope that you uh, read that. Joe, I want to back up. We yes. had someone pop in on the chat and recommend that you drink um, hot chocolate made from mushrooms while you watch this film. This was one of our NCC students who's joining us from up the hill. So okay. just wanted to share that. Thank you. I, I want to make sure that you know which kind of mushroom you're infusing your hot chocolate with. <laughs> Ireland, you got any suggestions on that? <laughs> okay, moving on to the next question. Thank you for that thought. She I'm says they're not magic. Okay. Sorry. 
Well, you know, I, I, I have a, a whole new appreciation for uh, mushrooms and mushroom hunters, uh, mushroom eating. It's very, very critical that you know your mushrooms very, very well before you ingest. My old adage when I talked about me was the delectability of a mushroom was directly proportional to the amount of butter in which it was sauteed. <laughs> but uh, I don't believe that anymore. There really are phenomenally subtle but exquisite differences be between species. But there's a lot of other ways to enjoy, to relish, and to cherish, uh, to recognize plants. And this gal, I don't even know her. Uh, she is an artist that I found on, online. She does these forest prayer flag projects in the lower right, you'll see her artwork. And up on the left, you know, one of the redwood robes that she hangs, prayer flags in and so on. But just that connection. I mean, you know, we've kind of skirted over all of this very boring uh, physiology of, of plants and so on. But you all know well, when you need uh, solace, when you need peace, when you need your head straightened out, you walk into the woods, you walk into the forest, you know. Uh, and, and so, you know, she's just a marvelous representative uh, of that. And the last slide um, is make sure that you uh, thank your plant today. I don't know if the, the newer, the newest uh, um, botany book uh, has the same artists, but this is an actual painting by an artist, um, yeah, in Michigan. And uh, so anyway, there's just so many different ways to to enjoy and recognize uh, plants. So that was my, my quick, sorry about the rough start, but um, we can open it up for questions at this time. <clears throat> I didn't realize that we went, went so late. Sorry about this that. This is why we tell you 30 minutes no, okay. and, give, and give you 80. All right. If there aren't any questions, uh, well, there will uh, be questions. I'll stick around. Uh, I heard something, and I'm sure I misremembered it, but there's something along the lines of plants move their roots towards pipes, and it's not because they sense the water, but because they hear it running through the pipes. Right. That, did I remember that correctly? Moving water. Like you're moving water, and so they grow towards yeah, pipes. Yeah, there's been a lot of experiments with this because they thought that they were just moving towards wetness, and they tried all different kinds of things. And it's it's you know you can put PCV in the ground and put you know it can wet the outside of it, you can wet cloth around it and everything. Roots don't go to it, but if you run water down that PVC. Um, then they will, in fact, move towards the sound. Of the so if you water. play a speaker that sounds like running water, they will go towards that, the speaker? That's correct. That, they've done that, too. Yes. Right. So do you think they're moving towards the frequency or the audible? Or, I mean, like, the, the feeling well, of it? Be, or the... You know, water has a lot of very interesting wavelengths within yeah. it, but I, but I think that that's the... It's, once again, this phonotropism where they're hearing a specific sound that they... That, that has worked for them before and sure. they move towards that sound successfully. So it's a natural selection type. That's right. So cool. Whoops. <laughs> so a question from Dean Medeiros in the back. Do you want to know? Absolutely not. If you don't know. What I watch online when you're not a <laughs> It's all for <laughs> Yes. I know some people think, you know, there's a lot of work on the internet about buying back stations and stuff like that. Do you have any like evidence of support of the fossil record of very large organs like products? Unfortunately, panda rots, and you know, and, and it grows in wet areas, and so you you, you don't get um, you don't get the the carbon dating you know that you'd like to have, like as opposed to like creosote, where it's out in the desert where you can go to the center of the clone and find things like that. But that's not answering your question. Um, 
So that that's why we can't go farther back than you know roughly 10,000, 12,000 years with, with panda. But with regards to other trees drying and going in drying, dry situation, you know that uh, what is that tree uh, up in Norway? It's called Tijiko, it's a Norway spruce. You look up TJIKO or something like that. It's a Norway spruce. And it, you know, they, they're trying to say it's over 15,000 years old or something like that. But if you look at it, it is, it is also like kind of uh, laying over in a ramen, you know, taking off from it or other uh, laterals taking off from a horizontally growing uh, system. So in that case, in a colder, drier environment, you know, uh, as opposed to starting in a seed in one situation, you know, growing annual rings and not being able to count backwards from there. Tajiko, that Norway spruce would be an example, example of it. And then in the case with, with a creosote bush, you know, you, if you fly over the Mojave Desert, you see rings of creosote bush. And you can go around these rings and these rings can be hundreds of feet um, in diameter or in circumference hundreds of feet in, in, in diameter. And, uh, but you can take a, a leaf from this plant, this plant over here, and one from the other 100 feet away, and they're exact uh, fingerprint identity. So you dig back into the center, dig around and find some dry wood someplace, radiocarbon data, and it's in excess of 10,000 years. So it's basically ice age uh, related. Yeah, so, you know, how old, are berry bushes, bramble bushes, you know, I mean, these things that have just been going around, you know, for literally thousands of years, um, you know, I don't, I don't know that we need to decide that our tree is older than your tree or whatever, but it pretty much blows you away that there are very few species that can just clone on uh, like that and continue to grow timelessly, you know, thousands and thousands. Yeah. Any other questions? Well, how the plan? I got I got more questions for yeah. you if we can. I mean, we got you here. I'm trying to find the slide about all the chemicals that the plants make, and I want to test your memory. Why do plants make caffeine? Well, because is it protect them or oh yeah, does it get us to eat them or? Well, I'm guessing that it, it's a it's a very bitter you know okay yeah it's better very bitter compound. And, you know, then you got to ask the question, what is it that, you know, that caused or forced some person to chew on a, originally, you know, a coffee bean and it was so bitter. And then for them to, you know, because making coffee is a big process, right? It's like cocoa and stuff like that. You know, you just don't go, oh, that should, that should be good. But, I'm, you know, I'm guessing that the first humans that chewed on it were very, very hungry and got stimulated. And so it was it acted as a stimulant, much like uh, nicotine. But, but other than that, I'm sure that that uh, God must have uh, chosen. Joe, you're being recorded. It's what we all require every morning to. <laughs> Can't think of some of the other chemicals that plants make of the why. You know, some of them are for protection. Yeah. But. Well, oh, okay, so. So chemicals. There we go. Uh, Nicotine, coca, mescaline, quinine, cocaine. Why do plants make those? Is it for them? Okay, I don't know. I'm just I'm curious. Yeah, I don't right. know. Help me out here. Yeah. It's primarily for I guess for preventing for bittery. Okay. They, they, they're pretty much all bitter tasting things, but I can't help but think that something like like um, uh, salicylic acid in willows and so on, that also is beneficial as an antibacterial to the plant. Right. You can't help but think that there's something that we're missing, you know, that they're not just manufacturing this to thwart herbivory, but they're also doing it because whatever that, whatever that compound is, that is being made is enable them to survive longer. Not just working for February. We got a question from a student at NCC. 
who asks, what's your take on herbalism in everyday life? Do you use plants to substitute modern day medicines or cleaning utilities, essentially trying to be more environmentally cautious, in other words, with not consuming as much plastic and whatnot? Wow. Uh, well, it, to be honest, we, we try our absolute best, uh, but it's very, very frustrating. And, you know, if I were to if I were to tell you now that I'm an absolute purist, I would, I would be, I would be lying. You know? So I think we're all struggling and working our way to getting away from plastics. Um, you know, I because I can't seem to quantify the electric car versus internal combustion engine. I I drive my old pickup down here, which gets good mileage, but it's not as good as you know. And then then there's the whole you know, lithium battery type, you know, questions and all these types of things. I am reading, you know, one of my favorite books right now is that, I, that I'm reading is, uh, it just, um, <clears throat> Kim Stanley Robinson, Ministry for the Future. And it's, and it might be somewhat of a downer for you, but it's also very chock full of attempted approaches to the food security problem, to the, the capitalism that, that drives, you know, all of our societies and drives the oil society and so on. But, you know, between him and Hawkins, who's Hawkins that does uh, Blessed on Rest? Stephen Hawkins? Oh, no, that's Hawkins. Uh, an economist that did Blessed, oh, oh, oh. Blessed on Rest and, and uh, re, Regeneration, Paul Hawkins. Yeah, Paul. Oh. Okay. Those are very, very helpful books that help you really stimulate your, your ideas on what can I what can I do at home? We all hate plastic. And then we go to the store to try to buy something. Then you go to the farmer's market, hope that we don't have to, you know, have the plastic bag that's required or something like that. But we're we're getting there, but clearly not fast enough. Um, so yes, I am a sinner. But I'm working on it. What's the name of that book, Ministry? Uh, Ministry for the Future. Yeah. It's by Kim Stanley Robinson. The first I would read, Regeneration by Paul Hawken. It's the W K E N. <clears throat> and it reads almost like a here's the problem, here's the solution. So you just almost like a dictionary of and, and importantly, his other book that's called Blessed Unrest. I think the best the best purpose for that book is to give you confidence that there are not just a few, but lots and lots of other people in the world, tens of thousands of individuals working hard to make this right for our for our future generations. Um, you know, how to how to enjoy life, how to eat, how to stay warm, how to clothe ourselves, how to save water, how to do all of these things. You know, requires that we design a, a different paradigm. We get out of the the the, the petroleum uh, addiction that that we are are now in, um, and we need to we need to do it faster than 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 we are faster than we are now. The reason for the ministry of the future that title was. A ministry was formed as a part as a part of the uh, Paris Accord or so on that would be dedicated with billions of dollars of money, you know, uh, allocated to it, so that it would be identifying the seventh generation, identifying the future. Who are we responsible for? How are we going to work so that our future generations can survive? Like beyond uh, climate change. It's all about climate change, for sure. But we don't, if we, if we don't continue to grow and enjoy and, and nourish plants, we have no choice. That's where it has to start. We have to stop polluting with carbon dioxide, but we have to, we have to literally stop paving over or synthetic. Photosynthetic pathways and photosynthetic uh, ability out there. And now I'm talking about every last uh, weedy lot that's out there. 
you know, every one of those developments that is on the books right now um, has should should be questioned for their real validity. Um, you know, we have still not yet equated the value of ecosystem services for that plot of land. We will give it a dollar value in terms of dollars per acre for open ground. We will give it a value of dollars per acre for the number of houses built upon it. We won't give it value in dollars per acre of oxygen production, carbon dioxide sequestration, soil stability, all of those kinds of things. We have to make that quantum leap um, into uh, you know, making the evaluating uh, you know ecosystem services. And <clears throat> we need to slow it up just a little bit too in terms of numbers, as we just yesterday passed eight billion. So, yeah. Yes, sir. What was it that book that has a uh, Bunch of examples of things that didn't work out. No, things that work. Uh, things that are working. Yeah, work. right. It's uh, it's Paul Hawken and it's Blessed Unrest. It doesn't just identify the climate crisis, but it identifies the inequality crisis. It identifies the social uh, conundrum that we're in as well. It is all, it's all interrelated. As we all know, or if we don't know, should you know, what we do, you know, in the first world has to trickle down to the to the third world as well. We can't just keep thinking about maintaining the status quo in a, in the first world situation. We have one more question that came in from Zoom Land. It's a very simple question to answer in the two minutes we have left. Do I love which my is wife? yes. Through your experience, what do you think is one of the best and possibly easiest ways the United States or just California could do that or could help we could do to help the environment? Easy question. Um, well, uh, appropriate uh, plant planting, but plant plants, you know, be careful about, you know, the situation, the fire situation and all of that and so on. Plant, you know, Native plants, plant xeriscaped plants, you know, um, and enjoy uh, and connect. Get out there, uh, garden. Uh, get your hands in the dirt, all you uh, soil people. Get in there and get the dirt. Uh, learn from master gardeners, you know. Uh, you know, yeah. Read some of these books. Read, you know, read some of the books that I that I recommended. They will inspire you. They'll they'll fire you up as well. For those of you who were at our last speaker um, on tribal or uh, cultural burning, they I got an email today. If you signed up for the Tribe Cadre um, email, and they did a burn today, and they're going to do an information meeting about it tomorrow. So if you are on their list, or go ahead and check that email and see if you if you have time to head up to Nevada County tomorrow to learn about their burn. Thank you, Joe, so much You're for great. joining us today. Inspiring us. So for inspiring us oh. for putting up with our technological issues. Yeah. Thank yeah. you, Zoom Land. That's that's why it's so much nicer to walk around the fire. It is face to face. You don't but have to don't do that all the time. No. It's a different world. But hey, we got extra people joining us because because of that. So. Oh, good. Yeah. Well, keep on keeping on. Nice.